Friends, thank you all for coming today to celebrate and critically to further the commitment to social justice of Maharaj Cole. My name is Lawrence Cohen, and I'm the, uh, here today as the director of the Center for South Asia Studies, and I teach in the departments of anthropology and of South and Southeast Asian Studies here at Berkeley. The Maharaj Cole Memorial Lecture was established by the family of Maharaj Cole as part of a Maharaj Kol Memorial Fund that has transformed the capacity of the Center for South Asia Studies at Berkeley to fund and sustain new and critical graduate student research. Raka Ray was a close friend and colleague of Maharaj Kol and of his family, and it was under her leadership that this uh, fellowship and this lecture was established. So before we introduce Arna Roy, I would like uh, Professor Ray to come up and offer some words on Maharaj Kol and the importance of this lecture and on the students who have been beneficiaries of the awards funded by uh, Raka. Thank you, Lawrence. I'd like to welcome Maharaj's family who are here today and to thank Aruna Roy for coming to speak to us today. This series is named after one of the most devoted, humble, and passionate fighters for justice that the Bay Area has ever seen. A man I was proud to call my friend, Maharaj Paul. Maharaj had a PhD, has a PhD in civil engineering from the University of California at Berkeley, but brilliant engineer though he was, his real passion was for social justice. Indeed, he founded more organizations than anyone I know, driving and uniting progressive South Asians in the Bay Area. At the University of California, Berkeley, when he was a student, he founded the South Asian Students Association in the late 60s. He also co-founded South Asians for Collective Action, Coalition Against Communalism, which was founded after the destruction of the Babri Masjid, India Relief and Education Fund, and the Gadar Heritage Foundation. I sometimes think that during those terrible years of the rise of the Hindutva movement through the 1990s, he almost single-handedly propped up secular and progressive politics amongst Bay Area Indians for a decade. He filled his home with activists, journalists, filmmakers, and fighters for justice. He worked closely with me to ensure that Berkeley students had access to films, information, and talks that countered Hindutva myths. He went to temples to try to convince those who were sending money um, to the Hindutva movement not to do so. And he brought documentary films from India about gender justice, the environmental movement, atrocities uh, against Dalits, films about Bhopal, and in so doing, not only did he introduce students here to these films, but he also gave um, the works of young radical filmmakers from India a chance, a first exposure here in the US. Maharaj really loved coming to the center and organizing events through the center. Um, towards the, uh, the later years of his life, he used to have a hearing aid and he would come nevertheless, and when he was interested, he would turn the hearing aid on, and when he was uninterested, he would turn it off. But he would always sit there uh, as a sort of true supporter of the center. It's particularly fitting that through a generous, generous donation from Maharaja's family, we are able to honor him with a lecture in his name every year. But as Lauren said, in addition to this, we've been able to fund students who wish to go to India to do internships, or preliminary research on development and other issues close to Maharaj's heart. The Maharaj Kaur Memorial Fund at UC Berkeley provides support both for this lecture and for these students. I believe we have some students who have been recipients of the um, of Maharaj Kaur Awards and if they're here, I'd like them please to stand up and be acknowledged. generous gift to Berkeley in Maharaj's memory. 
that not only is able to bring us speakers like Aruna Roy, but also to fund these students to continue doing the kind of work Maharaj so believed in. I want to give a special thanks to his family and a round of applause. Thank you so much. And, and as I step aside so that Lawrence can introduce our speaker for today, I just want to say this. Maharaj would be so happy, so very happy that we were able to get Aruna Roy for his memorial lecture. So it is with great pleasure that I turn this over to Lawrence to introduce Aruna Roy. Um, please turn your hearing aids to the on position. <laughs> um, I use notes, so you must forgive me for a second. It's, it's um, very hard to introduce someone that the audience probably knows much, much more about because of her legacy and her long work. Um, so let me do a very little bit. The, about ten years ago in an uh, urban slum in an Eastern UP town where I've worked for a long, long time, I began to hear conversations on information happening in a different kind of way around the politics of everyday life, about uh, thinking about questions glossed as uh, corruption, uh, about new strategies to organize, about new ways to conceive of the state, um, and um, indeed was witnessing in so many sites a sea change. And um, part of the reason we're here today to listen to Arun Leroy is her importance in um, affecting this transformation, uh, not only in um, towns in UP, but in places like San Francisco, where until recently a series of sunshine ordinances organized around a different vision of information and polity were transforming urban governance in our city and are under great threat at this moment in the last five years. Um, it's hard to know where to begin. Um, Time Magazine, and you'll forgive me for Time Magazine, Time Magazine has <laughs> named her as one of the hundred most influential people in the world. She came deservedly to the notice of the mandarins of the United States media because of her work driving the social movement for the right to information, RTI. Many pundits and scholars in many disciplines have argued that we live in an information age, but perhaps it is the signal achievement of Rana Roy and her many collaborators to demand the conceptualization of information as a right that more than anything else came to constitute a new order of politics, of ethics, of tactics, and of justice. Her labors led famously to the 2005 establishment of the Indian Right to Information, or I RTI Act, and to the use of RTI claims as a powerful weapon of the weak. Arna Roy has worked both inside and outside the formal structures of governance in the state of Rajasthan, nationally and internationally. She was an officer of the Indian Administrative Service in the critical years from 1968 to 1974. She returned to state and party governance in many ways. Um, the, um, she is, and this I learned only recently, one of the many things, she is the um, uh, president of the National Federation for Indian Women of the uh, CPI. Uh, she is, um, uh, central to the National Advisory Committee, or NAC, established by Sonia Gandhi in 2005, and she has a very critical, in every sense, relationship to that body, and its successor, the NAC too. She has founded, led, and participated in organizations too numerous to mention. She founded the MKSS, the Mazdur Kisan Shakti Sangam Natana, a collective bridging the interests of peasants and workers, and pioneering the practice of the social audit. She was for years part of the Social Work and Research Center in Rajasthan and its importance in the barefoot technology and empowerment movements. Arna Roy has been the recipient of many, many honors, including the very prestigious Ramon Magsaye Award for Community Leadership, sometimes referred to as Asia's Nobel Prize, and the Law Badr Shastri National Award for Excellence in Public Administration, Academia, and Management. Uh, the struggle for a right to information continues. 
Just this past month, headlines in India featured the government of Rajasthan refusing information to Arna Roy herself, as she attempted to use the law she had helped to establish to understand why the state has not complied with the law's provisions for information commissioners. She is currently active on many, many fronts, on whistleblower and anti-graph legislation, offering a critical counterpoint to the Anahazari movement, on the rethinking of the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme and what it might do, and on the future of nuclear energy and the recent government filing of mass sedition charges against thousands of villagers who will be affected by the Kudankulam nuclear plant in Tamil Nadu. Brought in by Sonia Gandhi to the NAC, she has never shied from acute criticism against the Congress-led UPA government. The Center for South Asia Studies heard last week from both the former Chief Election Officer of India, Asmai Qureshi, and a leading technologist establishing the Universal Identity Authority of India and its biometric card. A theme in both presentations was the flow of information and the response through better surveillance technology to graft and corruption. Arna Roy's approach to these questions has been different. As India gears up towards reconceptualizing information through centralized data integration and to addressing graft through what engineers term deduplicating the common man and woman, now imagined as data points, the relevance of Arna Roy's past, present, and future achievements has never been more critical. Please join me in welcoming her to Berkeley and to honoring the lifelong activism of Maharaj Kohl. To speak in the memory of a handsome man <laughs> and a great fighter, a person who was not daunted by anything to speak for the oppressed against injustice and who struggled for equality. I celebrate his courage and in speaking of many like him in India, I hope to keep his legacy alive. To the family of Maharaj Kohl, I can't say enough. Families who produce activists have both extreme admiration and courage that the person has that infiltrates into the family, but it also has problems for many of them. And I think I speak of my family, which sees me and my activism as something to celebrate and also sometimes something which gives them trouble. But I think activists at large in the world, wherever they may be, are very important and Maharaj Paul was one of the most important of them all. I must have met Maharaj when I came to the Bay Area in 2002, post the genocide in Gujarat, when Shankar Singh and I, another colleague of mine, we came specially to talk about what had happened in Gujarat and also talk about the nascent right to information movement and the struggle for it at that time. I want to th thank Lawrence for introducing me the way he did, but I actually am one of many thousands of people. Some of my friends are in the audience. There's Nikhil Day from India. There's Suchi Pandey, who wrote the first prime of a right to information. There is Siddharth sitting somewhere at the back, who also has supported all our various struggles. And there are thousands and thousands of ordinary people in Rajasthan who make this possible. Actually, the reason why I opted to talk on the topic of today, a concern of today, is because those thousands of people who keep democracy alive are really being targeted viciously in my country today. Nikhil and I left India rather reluctantly because we were really concerned about many issues. Kudankulam, where more than 6,000 people had been uh, charged with sedition <coughs> for asking questions about the safety of your nuclear plant and saying that before you fuel the nuclear plant, you have to tell us exactly what the consequences will be. Where thousands of fisher folk and ordinary peasants were almost pushed into the sea, and many of them stood in the sea facing police action of Khandwa, where many, many people stood 
chest deep and neck deep in water to protest against the non-implementation of the Supreme Court's order of rehabilitation before the waters in the dam could be released and raised, and about the seven-year-old battle in Posco, where there are thousands of people protesting against the bringing in of a uh, plant by Posco, the Korean multinational. It's our belief that these are illustrations of people using their democratic spaces to resist a model of economic growth that benefits the capitalist class and at a great cost to the rest of the population and near fatal cost to local communities. And today in India, it's really for me a pitch between democracy and a kind of capitalism. A universal, unifocused plan of development which is supposed to deliver and people who are at the absolute cutting edge and many others who are not literally in that physical sense over there who question these plans. There is an inherent contradiction in the notion of a capitalist democracy. And I want to show them to you in India through these three prisms. In Khandwa, in Tirnavali district and in Kudankulam, what are people saying? In Kudankulam, the government wanted to know, why now? Why didn't you protest 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, when the plant was being installed in Kudankulam? The people answered, saying that we didn't know what would happen till we saw Fukushima. We are in a tsunami affected area. We are on the beach. There are tsunami, there's a tsunami colony there. We now know what the implications are of a nuclear plant. So we will ask questions and we will protest. They have been protesting for over a year and the media in India, which is also corporate funded, did not show much till very late. It's only the last month or so that people in India, in northern India, know the name of Kodankulam. Kodankulam has remained an issue which was highly localized by the myopic nature of, uh, of, uh, of the media. As practitioners, we are all told that you keep within the confines of public action. You can't think. I have friends in Delhi who told me long ago, uh, in local English that speak that we speak in Hindi, they said Are yaar, which many of you are Indians will understand. Are yaar, you stay within the the limits of your public action and let us analyze and tell you what's wrong or right with it. But I don't think it's quite that. Because if you look at the right to information, the concept of this present law might have been formulated by people with a legal background. But the need for the law and the larger political inference of that law was shaped by very ordinary people in central Rajasthan. So people have political acumen, wisdom, and an understanding of politics, which may not have the right political phrases to fit into a certain ideological frame, but they understand what it means, but some of them understand them even within that idiomatic framework of democratic phrases and a language and a paradigm. I don't want to go into this endless debate a friend of mine who is a, who is a, a nuclear uh, scientist has engaged me recently on whether thought precedes action or action precedes thought or do words get formed before thoughts or thoughts get formed before words. It's a very good etymological debate to, or a linguistic debate to enter into. But I really do think these two things are indivisible because I think in action and in thought we are interlinked. That's why Yates, I was a, I majored in literature in Delhi University many years ago. So Yates' words come back to me, William Buckley Yates, when he said, God guard me from the thoughts men think in the minds alone. He that sings a lasting song sings in a marrow bone. So if you don't have the marrow of the bone and the cells of the brain connect somehow, we go wrong. And I think what's happening in Indian democracy is that the marrow bone of people's reactions and wisdom and their understanding of politics is not getting into the policy makers, the people who sit at the helm of affairs in New Delhi or elsewhere, who plan a kind of development which may in fact destroy our country. But before I talk any further, I want to show you two very short clips. In between, I'll just comment on them. The first clip is from Posco. 
So you hear people talk, not me. And then after that, we'll do a small one from Kudumkulam, and then I'll carry on further. पुष्पमय आंदोलन करते कहीं आंदोलन करते आमर जो भिटामेट रही जो काजु रही सजना रही पान रही नड़िया रही आउ सब प्रकार धान अच्छी सब प्रकार फसल रही तेणु से सरकार आष्को कंपानी ये जगह पर लोभ कर जगार आमको विस्थापित कर जगह नब नहीं तार कारखाना कर कंपनी बनाने के लिए सरकार सब कुछ कर रहा है इधर कोई भी आईन कानून नहीं मान रहा है फॉरेस्ट राइट एक्ट नहीं मान रहा है एनवायरमेंट लॉ नहीं मान रहा है सीआर जेट लॉ नहीं मान रहा है सब कुछ ये बेक गैर कानूनी करके ये सब कर रहा है सरकार ऐसा किया कि डायरेक्ट आया पुलिस आके हमारा लोगों के ऊपर फायर किया लाठीचार्ज किया फिर भी लोग कुछ नहीं बिगाड़ पाया जमीन भी नहीं ले पाया बाहर को मोर जो कम सब पड़े बाहर को मेकानिक कम से भी जापर नहीं बहुत असुविधा हो रोजगार पत्र बहुत कमी जाए जदि गणतंत्र प्रकृत गणतंत्र हिसाब करा जाए तो गोटे घर मूर भी जी चोरी कला तमें से घर के रही दि फार्मर्स रिफ्यूजल टू गिव अप देर लैंड टू फास्को स्पीक्स टू देर डीप कनेक्शन टू द लैंड द रिफ्यूजल इज अल्सो रिजल्ट अफ दि पल्ट्री कंपनसेसन अफर्ड बै पास्को The average annual income of a beetle vine farmer is about rupees 40,000 per decimal of land, which means that over the projected 30-year lifespan of the Pasco steel plant, an average farmer stands to lose an income of about 1.2 million rupees. In comparison, Pasco has offered a one-time compensation. of rupees 11500 in other words posco has offered less than 1% of a farmer's cumulative earning potential in return for giving up his land his home and his livelihood mane eti 7 barsha la am ladhe korchu mane eta ganatantra bile eti ame janu jao nahi pun ganatantra pai e ladhe chali ji ba bita mati ki ame chadi ganatantra pai eti sangram ko तेणु जदि विचार करा जाए कलेक्टर को प्रथम कलेक्टर फासी पाया कथा नवीन पट्टनायक मुख्यमंत्री दी थर फासी कथा क्या सब तार जनातार सब हो गोटे लोक को थे फासी जाए कि जीक अन्या से दी थर फासी दे आम लोक शांति हो राजनीति कथा मुझे कही पार जान लो आम धान पान चलो सी चंडा चली जाव आम बज चलीगले बिलवारी चलीगले आम अचल हो दाणर भिकारी हो How do we measure what has happened to the lives of the people of Dinkia, Patna, Gobindpur, and Nuwagaon? Does not being able to move freely or to work not constitute violence? Does living for over seven years in continuous fear of being attacked? not constitute being subhuman does not being able to sell what you produce to back breaking labor not mean a denial of livelihood does telling your child that she cannot go to school anymore not a loss of dignity Remarkable people, extremely intelligent, understand politics, understand democracy, understand ecology, understand the need that these things are to be protected for survival. People who are generally damned all over the world and even in my country as people who need to be trained, whose capacity needs to be built, whose minds need to be engaged with education. because they are illiterate but people who understand very clearly the power battles that exist understand where the interests 
their interests lie and where the interest of the environment lies, where the interest of the country lies. People who talk and face continuous police action. Every single day there's police action. But still, I would say this for Indian democracy, and that's where there's hope. They have still fought, fought for seven years, but they, they haven't been drenched, they haven't been killed en masse, they're still there. But this space that we have today needs to grow, to be protected. We need voices from all over the world to say that we are safe in my country. That when we do this, we're doing this judiciously, wisely, for myself, for my area, for livelihood, and for the country. And it's a debate that needs to carry on in much larger circles and much more strongly. Now we will see Kudum Kulam, which is in effect a struggle against a nuclear plant. It's not an issue of land. People surrendered their land years ago, lost their land. Most of the women who lost their land are now BD makers. The entire struggle has been financed by the fisher folk who have given one day's wages and BD workers who have given 10% of their earnings. The government of India, the Prime Minister said it was foreign funded. So a few months ago, they deported a German pastor from the area, closed down a leper home, closed down schools, actually put an embargo so that the area did not get drinking water for many months, many weeks. They, they have actually put Uday Kumar and another friend of his, Kushnarayan, Pushpa, Pushpa, uh, into a kind of hole because if they emerged from that place where they were hiding, they would have been arrested. Cases of sedition against 6,000 people. Women who didn't know what sedition meant. Fisher women. But when Xavier Amma came to Delhi in a public hearing and deposed, I was proud to be another woman in a country which produced Xavier Amma. She was fantastic. She spoke with so much intelligence. She spoke with clarity. And she raised issues which I didn't understand, I couldn't have understood 15 years ago, about nuclear radiation, the impact of it, what it would do to everybody, and she questioned whether they should stay in a country which didn't listen to them, didn't regard them, and didn't see reason. Because in Tamil Nadu, there is a strain of people saying that the Tamils should really separate from the Indian Union, which is an old story, which was revived by the youth of that area, who had Tamil Elam shirts and t-shirts. Said if, the, if India doesn't want us because our passports have been impounded, our permits have been impounded, we may as well be a different country. So what are we sowing the seeds of when we dismiss genuine questioning and protest and dissent in a democratic country raises very, very serious issues. So can we see a clip of Kurun Kulam now, please? Nangaki Akradanana and the Yungal Kavande, Nanule Yakumbodu, were a Alibida, other than the Vedipo or Alibo Vandichina, other than the Yunga Weir and Angi Apitaka to Kolanunga were paired at Paicha Kurgan Yakra. In the Anu Valela in there were Abutin Air Pata, Nakijampo Pukusima Vedicha Madri, Apudu were Nalama Air Pata, Indaya Makalke. Yarilla Purgurpa, Rathana Kakra, or Makal Kilapri Yar, Kudupanga, Kudateria, man, is a Yakunga Yakun and Soldaka, Mulki Yara the Yarangurta. Is an ala Yolo Fadi Priki, is an ala Yolo Noi Liriki, is an ala in the Kachina and the Kadri Vichinala, Nanule in the Var, Kadri Vichinala, Yolo Fadi Priki, as a mother mother, Pendal and the Padiki, and the Kurpeni Pendal and the Kurandela and the Padiki. The people who want. To reassure themselves, government should have sat down and reassured them over and over and over again. You take a vote just to gain that privilege to rule us, but that vote also obliges you to come and tell us hundreds of times that we don't understand why you think it is safe and why you don't think it is safe. Who decides in a democracy as to what we want or don't want? Have we explored, for instance, non-conventional energy, energy and how much it will cost? Have we explored all that? When we ask these questions, are we going to be treated as enemies of the state? 
Who pays what cost? Is financial cost higher than the cost of lives? In a democracy, dissent is a fundamental thing. If the whole parliament would be closed and shut down because they dissent, why can't people dissent? Why can't people say they won't agree? Should they naturally and automatically agree with every policy that the government has? Sedition and treason are words which are being used very casually today in the country. Sedition is a very serious offence and must be treated seriously. But you can't hold methods of expression and methods of protest in the, in, under the definition of sedition. Today, the need for a dialogue is the most important thing. If we live in free India and we are equal citizens, the people who rule us and us are on the same page in the constitution. If we demand the same rights as they do, then I think sitting and talking across the table is the only solution. <laughs>
But we will decide and you will have to listen because you are only people we sent to parliament for five years to keep our sovereignty going for those five years in trust. And if you don't act, then we can pull you back. If you don't act, we can ask you questions and you will have to act in our interest. You can't tell us that it's in our interest in a sense in which it doesn't have any real meaning. So I want to thank Anu Mandavili and her friend Deepak very much for producing these two clips. And it's been done in the Bay Area. And I want to say this very specifically because this is something all of you can do for us. It's not possible for us living in villages to produce these small clips. But these two small clips have been very powerful because they've put encapsulated what has been happening there. So it's going to be a holding of hands. I think now the world is small. We say the world is a global village. We say all kinds of things, but we have to make it a reality. And I think across the world, people who think similarly will have to hold hands. Therefore, we think that I don't have a road map which will end in a target for today's evening discourse. All I'm going to say is that we will all have to hold hands. And we'll have to think together. And we'll have to prepare for a long journey in which there will be many struggles at many levels, with many kinds of institutions and with and with violence. A non-violent struggle always faces violence in India, as anywhere else in the world. So we'll have to now develop and sharpen our tools of struggle. If we just go back to Ambedkar, and Ambedkar has been a very important part of India's uh, not only public action, but thinking. He gave some of the best, uh, I think he shaped the constitution in the best possible manner as, as, as the chairperson of the constituent, constituent assembly. But let's go back to hear what he said. This is something all Indians know because we've read this part of Ambedkar over and over again. But at the cost of being boring, I'm going to read it. He said on the 26th of January 1950, we are going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we'll have equality. And in social and economic life, we'll have inequality. In politics, we'll be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote, and one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall, by reason of our social and economic structure, continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. How long shall we continue to live this life of contradictions? How long shall we, how, how long shall we continue to deny equality in our social and economic life? If we continue to deny it for long, we will do so only by putting our political democracy in peril. We must remove this contradiction at the earliest possible moment, else those who suffer from inequality will blow up the structure of democracy which this constituent assembly has so laboriously built up. This is words of vision. Words which took into consideration the reality that is India. Divided by caste, divided by class, divided by religion, divided by region, divided by language, divided by gender and gender oppression, everything. And in this if we do not address those contradictions. Can we remain a nation? Can we remain a democracy? Vital questions. As we grew, as we got independence, Gandhiji was shot dead. A non-violent, a person who was the biggest protagonist of non-violence ended his life with a vile act of violence. He was shot dead and many things un remained unresolved we didn't have many of our contradictions resolved at independence. It could not be done. So we had many, many skeins just left hanging. We had Nehru with his grand social design, socialism, which he brought there and gave us many things. We had Gandhiji's sustainability, dream of sustainability at the village level, partly realized. What was Gram Suraj, we did not know. We had communists who spoke about equality. The realization of that equality was also left to the future, and we had our capitalists, the two names that rural India knows, Billa and Tata. We always say Billa and Tata, which means for us, capitalism. We don't use the word Punjiva, which is the Hindi word for capitalism. We say Billa and Tata. So the two big houses, industrial houses, Billa and Tata, were already there. But if we see what happened subsequently, post-1990, there was a great change. The liberal economy came in, 
the Soviet Union was dissolved, Cold War didn't exist. And the new kind of political economy and a new kind of liberal economy took over India. Most of what we read in Ambedkar took a back seat. Contradictions, they, they did not want to see the contradictions. And the only area in which we were forced to see the contradictions were the religious conflicts, where there was no chance. So whether it was genocide in Gujarat or the Sikhs, what happened with the Sikhs or what happened elsewhere or what happened with the Hindus, whatever it is, whichever community was targeted, you saw communalism coming. You had in that same year a group of people who got together in a small village called Devuri who decided to form a small workers and peasants organization called Mazur Kisan Shakti Samiti, which is the organization to which I belong. A hundred people got together and decided that peasants and workers had no chance to make themselves heard or felt in this political democracy unless we organized ourselves. And in that, there's a peculiar juxtaposition of the conflict areas in economy and the areas in which assertions were made like the right to information and the NREGA, and it still continues. I once went to Italy where people asked me, how could you have an India which spoke about 8.5% growth on the one hand and give a National Rural Employment Guarantee Act with 100 days of guaranteed employment with the liability of the government in case it didn't give you that employment with an unemployment allowance for people, workers who claim who could claim that their applications were received by the government, but government didn't give them that work. They said, what kind of a, what kind of an India do you live in? In India, because of what we read of, of Ambedkar at the beginning and of the nature of our polity and the nature of the political movements that have existed outside political parties, which is an inheritance from Gandhi, we have this peculiar system where you can have one parallel strain of conflicts and contradictions and you have another parallel strain of assertions and being heard. And this, I think, gives space to all our actions in India. But how it does and where it does and where we are losing ground also has to be seen. So we have, popularly we have, a notion that India is divided into two. Uh, Upendra Bakshi was the first person I heard speaking about it, but I'm sure that others said it before. In the constitution we say we give out to ourselves this constitution and we use two words. We use India and we also use, word, use the word Bharat. So Upendra Bakshi said that India is the land of privilege and Bharat is the land of the oppressed. Even in India. India you have citizens, in Bharat you have subjects. So I live between India and Bharat because I live in an area where people cannot claim their rights as a normal course, who can't even be recognized as individuals or as human beings if they enter a police station, if they enter a hospital, if they go anywhere, they have to prove that they are, have the right to be in that particular office even before they begin. But on the other hand, you have affluent India today, you have the malls, you have the airport where you land in Delhi, you have a different India and you also have access to the law. Just because I speak English, I have access to the law in India. But if you don't speak uh, this language, you speak only your vernacular, you don't have access to the law. So we have this peculiar sense of two Indias. And that is something we must understand. But we must also understand that Bharat is much bigger than the other India. Bharat is 60% of India and the other is maybe 40% today. So if we have any plan of development which doesn't encompass the needs and the demands of the 60%, we really can't go for any further. And economists here, I heard uh, on the YouTube a discussion which took place this month where you had one senior professor of Berkeley talking about how when there is no equality and when there is no distribution, which is equal distribution, you cannot have even growth. How can growth exist when there is 70% of your country pulling you down? So in this whole sense, the protests that you saw at POSCO, and the and in Kudempulam, and the third one in Khandwa, which recently has brought the government to its knees to some extent, 
where they asked for the Supreme Court to implement its, uh, the government to implement the Supreme Court orders, are all small or larger areas of victory. And this, these areas are important. The NKSS's journey was also quite, quite interesting because we could not be merely rhetorical. We could not say equality is a value. Our slogan says in Hindi, Nyay Samanta Ho Adhar, Aise Rachenge Ham Sansar, that we will frame a world, shape a world with equality and justice. But you can't just say that and sit in a village. Because every single issue demands that you act with equality and justice. A Dalit is beaten up, a woman is refused equal rights, wages are not given, the hospital refuses to give you medicine. Every single day there are 50, 20 cases where you have to transform that notion into practice. So much as we've had the wisdom of Gandhi and many others in the country, we've had the poor who are natural Marxists because they want equality. They want a social frame in which there will be a welfare state, which will guarantee them minimum, thing, minimum health, minimum education. You can't leave it to privatization. In India, if you leave it to privatization, you create a very, uh, a very uh, unpredictable and bad system of business. Because schools are business. Health institutions are business. There is no such thing as caring or concern for the ill. There is no, no issue of really teaching any child what the child should learn. The government school may be bad, but the private school is worse. I invite you to any sit town or village in Rajasthan. Please come and see our private schools. All our children wear ties. But that's all that is to say that they are they're trying to climb into a better world. They neither know their Hindi nor do they know their English. They don't know their arithmetic. They don't know the basic issues, which basic subjects which you should learn to be a good citizen. So schools are there. So what do you do when you have something like this? So that's why it's extremely important to begin with saying that there is a demand in Bharat for a strong but accountable state. We want a strong but accountable state which will deliver. We want a state which will take responsibilities, which will give us electricity, will give us water, will give us schooling, will give us education, which will give us health and deliver. And the Right to Information campaign was born, tried to make all these systems work, get subsidies which are there for the Dalits to work, the hospitals to work, the ration shop to work, the PDS to work. So it was not located in an abstract concept of what Right to Information should be in terms of the Indian Constitution, or of, uh, of a theory of equality. And in this sense, the free market remains an absolutely mythical notion so far as we are concerned. The poor can't operate the market. We have tried in the NKSS. We've started something called the Mazur Kisan Kirana stores. We have opened markets, uh, shops, which exist on the capital donated by workers. It's an interesting experiment, which we don't generally talk about. But we started this experiment to see whether we could bring the prices down in the market. We run a normal natural grocery store and the amount of uh, conflict, oppression and violence against that store is seen to be believed. The entire market gang because prices of purchase and prices of sale were made explicit, percentage of profit were made explicit, the nature of the goods was made explicit. It's not a free market and no laborer who works anywhere in the country can start a shop unless the, 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 the elite in that bazaar allow him to function. So what is the concept of a free market we wanted to work out for ourselves? It's everything is topsy-turvy. The starting line where you say there's a free market is full of handicaps. So a laborer can't function can't operate as a man with access to money, with access to ancestral money or loans from banks. We can't have the poorest, the lowest in the caste ever compete in fair competition. But what we've done in the public domain in India is even more frightening. We've taken these phrases and turned them inside out. So we have today in the Delhi University a group called, calling itself Youth for Equality. If I just say that, what would you imagine? You would imagine Dalit youth saying that we want equality, but it isn't so. It is upper caste young people saying that we want equality, but they already have more than their share. 
But what they mean is that they don't want reservation. And if you look at reservation, which is such a contentious issue, you will find the Dalits do not occupy top positions anywhere in the country. We did a rough and ready sampling in Ajmer district of the doctors. Not even 1% or 2% were Dalits. The rest are from upper caste communities. You take any specialized group, Dalits are not represented because they do not have access to the basic educational systems to allow them to qualify for better jobs. So the rising India of 8.5% is juxtaposed against a Bharat of falling indices in all kinds of manner that you may think possible. When we speak, we are the irritants. They don't want us to hear us speak. So now we have a lot of very interesting ways in which we are defined. We are called professional protesters. This is the latest. When Nikhil went to a television interview recently in Delhi, they told him you are a professional protester. What does that mean? It means that Uday Kumar, whom you saw in this film, who has lived for one year in, in a kind of restriction, uh, self-bound restriction in that place where he has lived, is a professional protester. So what do we gain from that? We want awards, we want name, we want money, we want what? We, what do we want? And the poor person who talked to you in the first film in the POSCO area, is he a professional protester? You take away his land, you take away his livelihood, you take away everything he has. So we are all called professional protesters. Then there is a file that is built upon us. And in that file they accumulate all kinds of details. Then we become anti-state. Then they will file an act, a case of sedition against us. From Binayak Sen and from before Binayak Sen, the famous case that has come up for all of, which all of you know about. To, to this day, sedition cases are extraordinary. And now they are more ludicrous cases. You know that in, in the case of uh, West Bengal, there was a case of a cartoonist. There is a case of a cartoonist <coughs> in Maharashtra. Sedition? For making a cartoon? How can you see that? So freedom of speech, freedom of expression, dissent, protest, have all got lumped together in a rather frightening presence of the state, which if it doesn't like what you say, just calls it sedition. In this case, if we go back to the directed principles of state policy, which again is something, as an Indian, I would like everyone to read. It reads like my manifesto in, in the constitution. It's not justiciable. But it says everything that I'm doing. It says that I have a right to fight for equality. It tells me I have a right to look for solutions to the kinds of oppression that people have. It tells me I have a right to demand education. It tells me I have a right to demand help. I have a right to demand everything under the constitution. But the directive principles of state policy and Ambedkar are on the way in India today. I'll just read again a little bit from that. What does it say? It says the state shall strive to promote, this is Article 38, the state shall strive to promote the welfare of the people by securing and protecting as effectively as it may a social order in which justice, social, economic and political shall inform all the institutions of national life. The state shall in particular strive to minimize the inequalities in income and endeavor to eliminate inequalities in status, facilities and opportunities not only amongst individuals, but also among groups of people residing in different areas or engaged in different vocations. Today in my country, individual cases of freedom may still be accepted. Cases of sedition against those two cartoonists may be set aside. But collective action is still sedition. The 6,000 cases to set them aside, I don't know what we'll have to move to get these 6,000 cases of sedition set aside in Kudum Kulam. But they are the keepers of Indian democracy and yet they are the targets of the system. So this anomaly comes for us directly from a kind of development plan and design that we call capitalist for want of a better word today, which has come to my country. In fact, if you go a little further, and look at the middle class. The middle class did extremely well in the first round of liberalization. They got very excited, more cars. In fact, in Delhi, you can't move. I don't know how many of you have been to Delhi. There's so many cars on the road that most of the time, till 2 a.m. actually, it's difficult to move on the road. People have more than one car, they have two cars, they have three cars, and their dream of a beautiful modern India was being realized, 
and we use a word called foreign. I don't know all of you know which means foreign. So anything foreign was very attractive, whether it was a dress or a, or a technology or, a, or, a, or some material thing, we were attracted. But the foreign attraction went because everything was available in India. But then the slump has begun. Because young boys and girls are taking loans to go to college because that's the new system. There is no free education. State has withdrawn support. State doesn't have enough colleges for uh, we call colleges. Your schools are our colleges, of course, you know that. So there is no no free colleges. I paid 16 rupees a month for the five years I studied in the Delhi University. Today, a student has to take a loan to study and the loans are frightening. It's 4% interest on a loan to build a house, 4% interest on a loan to buy a car, and it's between 12 and 13% interest for education loans and for agriculture. How do you expect the economy to prosper? How do you expect young people to study? <coughs> and when they get through their BAs and their BTECs and their MTECs or whatever law, or whatever they're doing, they need a job to repay that money and jobs are scarce. Today there's a growing number of young people with big loans to repay, with no jobs in sight. That's why all these protests draw young people today, no matter what you protest about, whether in Delhi or in Calcutta or in Jaipur or anywhere, you will get hordes of young people because they are frustrated with the state. The trouble is that they don't locate that frustration in a proper ideological framework like the poor do. They're not willing to fight it out. They're not willing to stay to see that the ends somehow become visible because of sustained struggle. They give up. But it's the frustration of the rising middle class that we saw in, to a large degree in the last two years in the big conflicts, uh, the big protests that were so highly televised. But we must understand also that all these areas of protest all of them, the real areas of protest, we don't want to see. Today, there is an organization called Ikta Parishad, which has marched all over India and is going to come with one lakh people to Delhi. But the poor don't get any space in the media. We'll probably get one shot, maybe, we are lucky, or maybe two television channels might interview them. <coughs> Land acquisition is a huge issue for us. But it's a non-issue for the media. And if you look at the right to education, the right to food security, huge issue for India. These are the real struggles, but these real struggles find no place. The RTI actually did something. It brought into the minds of people a method of changing the social arrangement. Because nobody is born poor because they have no ability to leave that state. Nobody is born illiterate because they don't have a capacity to get out of illiteracy. It's because these people are not given space in that social arrangement to get out of it. And what Right to Information has done is basically give people the wherewithal to fight the system through asking questions and demanding answers. Many of the scams that have come to light in recent years have all been partly the work of the Right to Information attempts of those struggles, getting the information out into the public domain to prove to people that what is actually what they're really fighting for is not because they are professional protesters, because it's something that will affect everybody, like the genetic modification of the Brinjal. BT Brinjal was stopped because of an RTI application. The campaign unearthed the fact that the negative impact of the Brinjal would be horrible. Because of that, it was stopped. So you have many of these tools of assertion today and these tools of assertion are propped up. And many of people ask, some of us, you're always fighting for these things. Why do you go on asking the government for NREGA, for RTI, for right to food, for right to something else, for now we're going to fight for right to universal pension. Why do you want these handouts from the government? But you say, well, these are not handouts, these are our rights. And the only way we can get the balance is if we struggle for them with our large numbers and get something in the nature of a, of a balance. So what really we are fighting for is to keep this battle alive. Where democracy manifests itself through these millions of protests. In India, I highlighted only three protests. There are hundreds of protests. 
And these hundred of percent protests, if you plot on the map of India, you really feel in, see in India with a million protests, to borrow a phrase from Rai Paul. Called his book, The Million Mutinies. We don't have a million mutinies, but we certainly have a million protests. And none of them, and none of them want to finish democracy. They see their, their rights and their ability to fight the system only through this system which we call democracy. <coughs> Many issues have been touched upon by the campaigns we have developed. To counter that, we have developed and now assert our right to govern ourselves. And that's what they simply do not like. Right to information has caught them at the end of a stick, cleft stick, because we say we need, we have the right to govern. They gave us the right to information. Sometimes I wonder how they did. But they gave us the right to information. Because of the right to information, we can access information and establish that we have a right to decide. And because they don't want to give us the right to decide for ourselves, but they can't deny us a legal right and the right to information, they're caught in the cleft end of a stick, as I said before. And that is, again, a strong assertion which gives hope to people that they may be able to get through somehow face the contradictions that exist in our society, in our framework, in our economic framework, and everything else. Whether it's the Comptroller and Auditor General today, who's exposing these big scams through releasing his documents, so that we all know what it says, not only Parliament, but people know. And the right we are demanding to frame legislation, which is another big battle we have. The right to demand accountability is seeing India through a very, very difficult phase. And in all of this, People who demand are more democratic and the people who deny are not. And somehow this has to come to our debate and discussions. And, but the most heinous of them all is the economic paradigm, where there is no patience. Because money must be got today. There are coal fields you have to mine, your extractive industries are everywhere, your nuclear industries are everywhere. And when we ask the government that if your nuclear industry is actually for peaceful purposes, why can't you share the information? You say it's for creating electricity for me. So I have a right to know how will you create that electricity. You have security issues. If you're using it for what, but you're not. Government had no answer. I'm going to end with a small quotation from Jeremy Cronin, uh, leader of the Communist Party of South Africa, poet writer. And for me, having read him, a great man. And he defines democracy and he says, what is democracy? He says, democracy is speaking truth to power. Democracy is speaking truth to power. And for Maharaj Kohl, what better? Better could I say than that. Speaking truth to power, making truth powerful and power truthful. If we achieve these three things, we achieve democracy. Otherwise, we will stay enslaved. The nation will be free. We'll go to the polls every five years, but there will be no real democracy. I. Perhaps I've overstepped my time. I crave your indulgence for that. And I've also brought, unlike myself, a written paper. I normally come without anything. But this time I've come with a written paper. And since this is a conversation, and if there is time, I hope for questions and answers. And after that, we will modify this paper. I was told by friends, Binas told me that you'll put this up on a website. But I think the paper should also circulate because there are many things that can't be said in a half an hour which can be said in a longer paper. So I hope this conversation continues. I hope you'll criticize me. I hope I will tolerate dissent and you'll tell me that I'm wrong or right or partially wrong or partially right, but that this debate and discussion carries on and that you gave me an opportunity to present my nascent ideas, our nascent ideas to you. I want to thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Roy. It's an honor to speak with you. Um, I'm a student here at UC Berkeley. Uh, my name is Lily Galsetaga, and I actually was in southern India this summer for a two-month program uh, in conjunction with Tata, actually. It's uh, the International Social Entrepreneurship Scheme. And uh, my task was to go down and work with Titan, the watch company, and to do an affirmative action project there and to see how we can uplift those uh, in the central caste schedule tribes through education, employability, entrepreneurship, and employment. Um, so my question for you, um, we can also have a discussion about this, um, is that you have these private actors, these businessmen who are trying to incorporate people of the lower caste into the modern business private world. 
through public-private partnerships and that kind of thing, and their own schemes that are being run by their own workers. Um, do you see any potential for this uh, in the future as the avenue to develop civil society through these economic powerhouses, or are you looking for an alternative avenue to gain power for these people? Thank you. Maybe we can take two or three questions and then Thank you, ma'am. It's an honor to be here and to have heard you, especially. I'm a, I'm a law student at Bolt and I'm from Pakistan and the, net, the parallels are just astounding as well as depressing. But uh, my question was in relation to the shrinking space for dissent in Indian society as well as most post-colonial societies and how we would look at then stuff like the Nazi like movement. I mean, is that the way we now imagine dissent? Do we necessarily and is this the way we now see the same going? Is this how it's supposed to be to be to have a military element, to have a violent element? Is that how things should now go? Thank you, ma'am. Um, so I'm sure both of us agree that India already has a deficit about 15% electricity, and this deficit is only increasing year after year. I'm extremely ashamed as to how the Indian government handled the situation could have for instance. But considering that nuclear power itself is considered to be often much safer to the environment compared to wind energy and solar energy because of mining of many rich minerals. And for instance, uh, George Moynbot, who was an environmental skeptic about nuclear power in UK, after the Fukushima disaster, he actually started supporting nuclear power because given how old the plant is and how badly the safety regulations were applied there, in spite of that, the magnitude of the disaster was much lesser than what was expected. So let me put my question in a much more constructive way. If you were in the administration of India, how would you have handled the Kuranpur situation there? <laughs> I will uh, I'll take the first question first, if I may. And actually, I think you know I have a, I have a maybe an old-fashioned response. As you can see, I more than six decades old. So anyway, the thing is, corporate social responsibility is what you're talking about. And I think it's appeasement. If Tata is really interested in developing people, the first thing it could do is dialogue with them. There are many places where people don't want Tata to come. In Singur, what did they do? Why don't they enter into a discussion? I heard from the governor of that state that other land was offered to Tata, saying don't take three crop land, take some other land. Why don't they enter into discussions with people? We don't want this kind of patronizing treatment done by very rich people saying that they'll give us body pops. We want equality. See, that's where the problem lies today in India, because people are now educated, they are bright, they understand democracy, they understand as, they, as we say in Hindi in my area, that you don't want to give up one crore or rupees for one paisa. So all they offer you is one paisa. <coughs> but what we want is that one crore, and that one crore may not be money. It may be privileges, it may be equality, children's education, it can be health, it can be the future. Why don't they do that? So I think it's, in my opinion, it's even more dangerous because money that could have been given to good NGOs or good institutions which would have run with competence now are taken over by these corporate social responsibility groups. I'm not saying that they're all bad. They may be doing some good, I'm sure. But you are the economists. You're the people who look at per capita returns. You're the people who are researchers, scholars. If you invest the same amount of money and time in some other process and you get much more, then would you do this if you were getting profits? For me, the profit is people getting more developed, more engaged, and more independent and self-reliant, not dependent on somebody else. So that's where I think the argument goes awry between corporate social responsibility and us. And this public-private partnership is really one way of saying that government and private capital will get together. We turn it around and say, have public people participation. Have the people. We are also a P. I mean, we stand for the letter P. They can say, we are also people. Why don't you consider it that? In many of these arguments, we've said that you must consider us as, as, as a partner 
not really private capital. I want to give you a very good piece of news. Then in Pakistan, between Pakistan and India, if you're 65, you get a visa on arrival. I'm so happy. <laughs> because that means I can go tomorrow if Karamat Ali invites me to Karachi for a meeting. I don't have to wait for months on end for the Pakistan High Commission to give me or not give me a visa. Suchi and I went together to Pakistan and I was the speaker and they didn't give me a visa. So in the end, the ambassador, the Pakistani ambassador to India had on personal guarantee give me a visa. So it's so difficult. So I think we share so much. And I really do think the most important thing for South Asia is to visit each other. We have similar problems. We have similar mindsets. We have similar issues. And we understand each other. And I think, having said that at the beginning, I'd like to say that Nakshalism is really dissent. But it's dissent pushed completely <coughs> with their backs to the wall. 50 years, we have not given them basic amenities. 50 years, the tribals have been used as an inferior people. They have not got development, they haven't got water, they haven't got education, they haven't got any service. Even so, they kept quiet till the industrial development and the liberalization programs began and huge companies went in and invested in that area and threatened to take away the last vestiges of their dignity and self reliance So Nakshalism is a, is a reaction to that, if it is. And even in Nakshal areas, not everyone's a Nakshalite, by the way. But of course, government of India would like to say that everybody is a Nakshalite, but not everyone's a Nakshalite. The people there who may or may not be pro the violence, but who by their predicament would sympathize with anyone who would set that aside. I spoke recently to a collective and he said, if development really goes to that area, this militancy will reduce dramatically. But who is to say that? What we do is we set up Salva Jurum, which is an army created, para army created by the state government, supported by the government of India, which is armed. And so you create a kind of civil war. It doesn't resolve anything. So really and truly, if we want people to have equal rights, we really mean it, we work towards it, this form of violence, this violent dissent will dramatically diminish. And I want to say to you, because uh, I'm with the South Asian group here, recently Nikhil and I went to Kashmir. We went to Yusmal for an RTI convention there. And there were 750 RTI uh, activists from all over Kashmir. And they kept saying, you from India have given us the RTI, you Indians have given us the NREG, but they were very interested in these two laws. They asked me what was my position on Kashmir's independence, and I said, that's a political decision you and the Union of India will have to take. So I will abide by whatever political decision you arrive at, but why are you interested in the RTI and the NREG? And they said, can I speak in Hindi? Will most of you understand? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Urdu. Hindi is like Urdu, so you may understand. And then I translated to English. He said, Ji, Jana, Azad ho bhi jaye, to hume to hukumat se to baat to karni padegi. Aur hukumat se baat karne ke liye suchna ka adhikar to chahiye. Unko line ke lana hai na, to line pe kaise laenge? To us pe suchna ka adhikar chahiye, aur rozgar guarantee kanun bhi chahiye. They said we want the right to information, even if we get independent of India. Because it's a way in which we can make the state accountable. And whether we're free or not free, we want an accountable state. And they said about the employment guarantee that we want employment, because it's one of the biggest issues for poor people. So we want guaranteed employment. So I think it's a very, very important thing that we realize. that what people want, they don't want a song that my friend Shankar sings, we don't want palaces, we want we don't want big cars, we don't want money in the bank, we don't want this, we don't want that. We just want to know how much money there is for my health, how much money I'm going to spend in my school building, and why are you not giving me my minimum wage? And if you deny me that, then there's something wrong with this concept of democracy. So that's what we say when we, when we talk, and when I say we talk, we talk. I don't know what I would have done if I had been in the administration because I walked it out of it. 
because I did not want to behave like that. I didn't want to work like that. I didn't want to work with a limitation imposed on me on my intelligence and my reason because my boss says. So I left the administration. So I don't think, and it was too long ago. So I really don't know what I would have done. But when you say that it is more safe, you have to convince me. People of Kodam Kodam need to be convinced. Every day you will wash the plant. First of all, you don't have enough sweet water to wash the plant. Everybody knows that in Kodam Kodam. How are you going to wash the plant? It has to be cooled. If you set up a desalination plant in Kodam Kodam, it's going to be frightfully expensive. We know all that. Then when you wash the plant, that water is going to go into the sea. That water is going to destroy man in life. It's going to destroy man and that will be some radiation in the water. <coughs> so how are you saying, what am I saying, what is anyone saying, by saying that's safe? How do you say it's safer than an extractive industry? Because in fact, this is irreversible. What happens otherwise is reversible. It's the same problem with the BT Brinjal. I mean, they showed us films in which a rat, which had been fed with something uh, special, became so huge but its legs remain the same. So imagining your child in your womb becoming something like that with a huge head and four tiny arms and legs is frightening to us. You have to assure us that there will nothing go wrong if you are a scientist. It's your job. It's not the administration's job. It's, it's the administration's job to take that information to the people. And if you are right, then you must come and sit with us across the table and convince us. But as it stands today, we did, do think that nuclear energy is much more harmful. Hundreds of cases in the whole of India, in all kinds of places, where the plants have been, with Ravad Bhatta in Rajasthan, so many other places you have people who are ill with cancer, so many cases recently of even these mobile towers giving you cancer in Rajasthan. So we have to be convinced. And if we in a democracy have a right to decide, then you'll have to take that education very seriously. And if we are convinced, we change our mind. I mean, there is no such thing as not changing our minds. It's not a question of money, being bribed to change your mind. It's a question of being really convinced that it's safe. Namaste, Runaji. Um, regarding the land acquisition problem, um, so I would like to hear from your experience. It's very difficult to put a tangible value, like a, a tangible amount on the emotional attachment with land, but for the people who are affected by land acquisition, and I think that's something which we will have to deal with in India. Um, what do they look for? What, what would you say constitutes a fair compensation package? And you know how should we like discuss or try to arrive at that issue? Thank you. Um, it's a great honor to hear you speak. Uh, my name is Vasanti. Uh, I had a question about the uh, about the uh, uh, conversation around the Lokpal bill. Um, uh, I remember that when I, uh, when uh, uh, your comments were quoted in the media as the Hindu said, Aruna Roy annoyed by Anna Hazare, and then uh, and then when uh, you know the media's favorite agent provocateur or Arundhati Roy also made express some misgivings about Anna Hazare's version of the bill, it became uh, an issue of. Uh, you know, a bunch of professional protesters against versus another bunch of professional protesters. I mean, that was how the media portrayed uh, more nuanced uh, criticisms of Anna Hazare and his movement. Uh, my question, I guess, is uh, what was really happening? I mean, was Anna Hazare, uh, Anna Hazare's movement really a people's movement that had captivated the imagination and the uh, inspiration, but inspired people across the classes as it was portrayed? from the poorest as well as the middle class had been, um, uh, had found a, a common uh, reason to go, come up, come uh, to back uh, this movement or was it really something that the media felt that well this is a safe enough bill that we can support because it's against corruption which also hurts the middle class groups and if so uh, what was it that uh, your version of the bill uh, tried to address uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for such a nice, informative, and uh, very profound yeah, thing. And I totally agree with the, all these issues. I mean, what you said, 
But there was something in the process in a of a general nature which you said, which I have some uh, reservations about it. Like, for example, when we give this kind of general statement that people know, people understand. So in some time, in some given situation, well, people understand, people know, but many times, I mean, there are, uh, I mean, examples in history also, or we can have something hypothetical also. In some society, you know, like for example, today, 100% people or 90% people can say, well, okay, these, you know, like, uh, I'm just saying, for example, like, uh, say, homosexual, they should be punished, or rather, should, they should get severe punishment. So what would you say that because uh, majority of people are saying and asking it, so people understand, people know, so it is fine, okay. So this kind of thing, I mean, this kind of complexity is mean, better we keep in mind. Thank you, uh, once again, Mrs. Roy. Um, I just had a question. So much has been made about this tension between democracy and capitalism, even in the United States. And I guess I was just, Given in light of what we've just heard and all of the challenges that face uh, democracy in India and uh, Bharat as well, um, what is what are the lessons that like democracy over there can teach us about democracy over here? Thank you. I think with the land acquisition law, see basically what we're doing is saying that land can be acquired for public purpose. What a public purpose is, is contentious. Is public purpose setting up an SEZ? Is going to profit some people? Is public purpose an industry in which I'll have no share? Is public purpose a hospital? Is public purpose a school which I'll send my children to? What is public purpose? The second contentious thing, which with the government simply does not agree even now, that we say that there should be prior consent that without prior consent, land cannot be acquired. If you see this trajectory of land acquisitions, you will see that in most cases, land has been acquired from people who cannot really prevent that acquisition. I always think whether it's Kudun Kulam or whether it's land acquisition, supposing we say, uh, many of you know New Delhi, the most posh part of New Delhi is Lutyen's Delhi. This is just around India Gate where all all the uh, ministers, and, uh, the civil servants and the generals and everybody else lives. So I think we discover under that that there is uranium or under the Rashtrapati Bhavan, which is the president's <laughs> home and office. Will we just uproot it? Okay, these are government houses. Supposing in golf links or Maharani Bag or Friends Colony <laughs> or civil lines or anywhere that rich people live, you discover that there's going to be, are we going to just ask them to leave, throw them away, not give them adequate compensation? We don't even look for, look for minerals under places where they live. So it's been a rather extraordinary thing that we look only for displacing people who are intimately connected with natural resources and in far flung places, far away from where we are, and we think they should pay the cost of development. And that's what these three protests very interestingly raise. Who pays the cost and who decides? Sure, there must be very many things that should be done. Land should be acquired. And it's inevitable that land will be acquired. But where the land will be acquired, for what public purpose and whom it will be acquired, who will benefit from the land acquisition, are issues that are not being really politically addressed. So the Land Acquisition Act is going the ding and the dong, it's not going to, it's coming out bald, people are not happy and so on. So I think if we insist on prior consent and we insist that it should be with people's consent, then there will be an improvement. And the package is the second thing. But in, even where there's a package which people have agreed to, like in Khandwa, you're not giving it to them. Supreme, Supreme Court ordered that six months before you release the waters, you must settle them. Even that is not done. Where the implementation is so terrible, how can you have an absolutely violent and aggressive land acquisition act function without violent protest? It's something that is natural. The Lokpal bill, quickly. Uh, yes, it was a difficult time for us. 
because uh, corruption has been an issue for the MKSS. The right to information actually was partly corruption. But we had twin objectives. We had corruption and the arbitrary use of power. And the arbitrary use of power, because whether it's Gujarat or whether it is government uh, deciding on Kudum Kulam or anywhere else, may not be corruption. They may not have taken money. But the arbitrary use of power comes as harshly down on people as corruption does. So we put the two things together. And if you look at corruption, if you just look at it, as Arundhati said, as a moral issue, we'll all agree. Who will disagree to say corruption is bad? We'll all agree. But when you look at it politically, you look at the roots of that corruption, then there are many ways in which you will see it. And for instance, that, that group of people who got together in India against corruption, many people did not see as the right group perhaps because there were people who were soft in the in that group. People who may have supported, you might have a, an RSS person, very honest, or a Muslim League person, very honest, or a militant Sikh who is very honest, or a militant anyone who is very honest. But honesty by itself is not enough. You also have to have a vision of fairness, equality, and constitutional rights being protected. Otherwise, that, that kind of honesty doesn't take you anywhere. And you have to build that kind of coalition, and I think they couldn't build that kind of coalition. And for that reason, there were a lot of side protests. The NCPRI, the National Campaign for People's Right to Information, which Nikhil and I and Suchi and all represent, we protested that the law itself was not correct. They proposed a huge bureaucratic edifice, which the, uh, that's why Nikhil and I wrote an article in the Outlook immediately after, which was called The Cure is, Cure may be worse than the disease. And, uh, but we were very unpopular because there was this whole media and and uh, mass hysteria that happened in all the cities which were not willing to take any difference of opinion and that only that version of the Jan Lokpal bill was right. <coughs> if you disagreed with that, you were a traitor. These were the messages that we got. And there itself there was a need to look at dissent. So if you are dissenting from the government and you do not accept dissent or something like the nature of a bill, I mean it's not made, so we said that instead of one law, we should have four laws, and you all know the big debate that went on. So I don't think what Hindu said, I would agree with, but perhaps some people would, that I was, that we were annoyed by Hazari. And we tried very hard to say it's not Aruna Roy, Aruna's bill as against Hazar, Aruna's bill. We said it's an NCPRI bill, that might be uh, Aruna's bill, but this is an NCPRI bill. I think by the time we finished the campaign, the media also started saying the NCPRI version, the NCPRI version, because we had to fight. That brings me to the other issue, that leadership for the RTI has been a collective leadership, though my name is unfortunately got predicted. But I am not, I can't frame a law. You know, I can fight a public battle, I can engage in political uh, battle, I can engage in, uh, with people, I can uh, mobilize. But I am not a drafter of a legislation. Uh, I have again in the audience Nikhil who drafted the legislation from 1996 to 2005 and I have Suchi who understands the law much better than I do though she came into the campaign much later. I, I, did, I can't do it. And there's Siddharth who's a law student who's helped us time and again with <coughs> formulations. So none of us can do everything. So the RTI and SPRI campaign understood that you have to have a democratic campaign in which skills are diverse in which you know, natural gifts are diverse and each one's voice adds to the next. So the leadership issue is also an issue which I, that there are many things I couldn't touch upon. But in democracy, that's why the collective is so important. They are alone, they're collective, really they are a collective. A group of equals. And we always look for that one person who will change the world and it's not true, it's not going to happen. And if I can quote Eduardo Galeano, whom I heard in, uh, in Barcelona many years ago, and I was so taken with him that collective leadership is democracy and other leadership is not democratic. But we have lost sight of that collective leadership and that lateral accountability which is so important for people if you want good governance. Media support, yes, they caught actually the people, but there was one thing which I must say that they caught the angst of a lot of people, especially the middle class were so angry with the government, which was so angry with all the dreams that they had seen which were not fulfilled and the urban poor, many of them went and supported them, it's true. But if you see the large scale relationship of the campaign, the poor were not represented, their issues were not represented, 
The Dalits were not represented. The Dalits formed a separate group, actually, to say they were not part of IAC. So there were issues that were separate and uh, worked separately. The media support is a huge issue. I won't take it up now because we have so many theories in India. You know how we are rife with theories. I think there is no more political group in India. Everybody has a theory from the villager to the prime minister, I'm sure. Everyone has theories and we argue like anything. Not for nothing did uh, uh, Amartya Sen call us the argumentative Indian. <laughs> I have an last question, please. I have to answer two more. She has to answer the uh, People do not always understand. And I stand corrected. But what I was saying was in relation to the development, the invasion of a development paradigm into our lives. And of alternatives for development for ourselves, we know the best. But even there, we may be wrong. There are many examples. One is what we call in India, new word, political word, I don't know if it's come to the US, majoritarianism. Because democracy is about the majority. For instance, in Gujarat, they all voted Narendra Modi back. But that doesn't bring down the heinous of his crimes in 2002. How can you say he was not indulging in criminal acts when he issued orders that no police station would register a case when the 2002 genocide was taking place? So there are cases in which people may not know. People group together in castes and they do not know. But by and large when we say people know in a democracy, we are really talking it at the lowest common denominator where is major issues like corruption, whether it is issues of accountability, there are some things that people know. But I do think you have to agree on certain principles. Those principles can't be violated. What happens when there is disagreement of the kind you mentioned, when people don't know, the honor killings that have started happening now, just in the area where Nikhil and I live, a young woman from the Rajput family had the audacity to marry a young boy from a Dalit family. Her father caught hold of her and actually sliced her head off it's just a few months ago. And when he was arrested by the cops, he and his entire family said, oh, he did well because he protected the honor of the family. But surely this is not right. Surely it's not right. Sati is not right. Bright burning is not right. So many things that people do are not right. But then it goes against a principle. And democracy... Uh, what can India teach? I think India can teach you some things. I may be wrong because my, uh, my understanding of the US is very limited. I've come very few times and I haven't traveled very much. And like I am now, I speak mostly to people from South Asia and I go back. So you must, must not misunderstand me. But I think one or two things that India does, I think, is good for the world. And one thing is that we can't be gagged. We talk. <laughs> and we talk a lot and we question a lot. That's absolutely true. We question and we also see the state as relevant, which the US is not. I think in these occupation uh, campaigns that you've had in US, I was talking to Mike and we were discussing things and what I understood from it is that if you occupy, then you have to understand that a state exists. You can't wish away the state. So I think in that, India understands that the state has to be there, it's got to function, it's got to deliver, it's got to listen to me and satisfy me. But without a state, I think a democracy, a political democracy doesn't work. And I think maybe in India we understand it very well because we are at that point of development where the state, and I think we per perhaps perpetually be there in many ways, the state will be relevant and important and its, its role cannot be mitigated for us. Perhaps in that, I'm saying perhaps because I'm not sure. There was a, a final question claimed from the floor and then we'll turn it over to informal discussion. Good evening. Thank you, Madam. It was very interesting to hear you. I just would like to know the latest rage in India, you know, as you were talking about dissent and protest, the latest FDA problem, which is almost going to bring down the government. So, and even among the partners of PPA, you know, one person, one state chief minister has protested, but we don't, we never know what will happen tomorrow. Do you think that all this protest and dissent, there is some corporate bodies behind it? Some people say, because they are not interested in the FDA. Second thing, is it really good for India and will it affect the farmers and agriculture? I would like to know your opinions. Thank you.
Thank you. We both come from the same college in Delhi. So I'm glad you raised this question. Yes, the FDI, in my opinion, and the opinion of my friends who have come from India to this meeting, is not a good thing. Because in Kudam Kudam, you saw, I saw a thriving fishing community which was going to be ruined. I saw a thriving limited BD manufacturing unit that was going to be finished by this development. India's lower middle class is tradespeople. If they lose their <coughs> livelihood, India will have tremendous trouble. And I'm also afraid because this community of tradespeople, many of them are very strongly fundamentalist people. So what shape their protest will take is another fear. I'm just thinking as I speak to you, I may be wrong. It could take a fundamentalist tone which would really harm India fundamentally. So that's another one. The other thing is I don't believe that where there's a thriving economy, why do we need these big stores? It's so boring apart from everything else. There's so many options in India. Or in India anyway. If this shop doesn't deliver, you can go to the next shop. You can argue, you'll have a different set of wares. And everything is different. And you know, you can bargain and you can take. Which is India. Instead of that, we're going to have these big shops, chain shops turn up and sell you the same thing. So whether I'm in India or Pakistan or Malaysia or Singapore or Delhi or USA or anywhere, same boring range of goods. I mean, even if you look at that level, but at a political level, it's disaster. Of course, there's pressure from corporations. The more fundamental question is, why is the government of India behaving like this? Why is the government of India under pressure? Why is our Prime Minister under pressure? What is it that has replaced real political leaders by technocrats? I'm just raising something and throwing it at you and I will go away. Is it because we say, and that's another argument about the IAC which frightened us, that all politicians are corrupt, so you must get rid of politicians. Should we get technocrats in their place? Will technocrats see solutions? Will they understand the plight of people? Who cares? If you're a technocrat, you have a very limited vision. A politician has by force and by, by duress to have a larger vision of what he or she has to tell them. So I think India is in for deep trouble. And I think we are all very upset with this decision. And that's why when we raised, the NCPRI raised what I mentioned very briefly, about policy and legislation being in the public domain before it was passed by government, the government has really clamped down on. They simply don't want to do it. Because this FDI as a policy should be up for people to see six months before it becomes policy. So we have the right to dissent, to disagree, to protest, to force the political system to change. So the next battle is pluralistic. There will be the business and the trade battle, the livelihood battle, there will be the transparency and accountability battle, there will be many battles. And as India, as in Ruta Kete, Ram Barose. Not that we, I believe in Ram, but the saying is Ram Barose, which means God alone knows. And someone says if there was no God, how was India running? So I can't predict the future. But I think there will be fair amount of chaos and re, uh, re-patterning of the political arrangement in India. I think the center is soon going to be less powerful. State governments are going to be more powerful. And that will be both plus and minus because there are certain things that state governments have to be forced to do by a central government, which the state government may not agree. There are confused and very complex politics. But I think, uh, per se, the decision is wrong because it will affect everybody. It will affect people, it will affect those people who run those businesses. It's going to also have an impact on agriculture, it will have an impact on everybody. So, in a moment, I'll ask you to bring your theories to the back of the room and we'll continue conversation. Um, before I thank uh, Arnoji, there are many people here responsible for the event. Um, they know who they are. The time is late. Let me thank um, you two thanks. First to the family of Maharaj Ko, uh for this event, for this series, um, and for extending his example 
Um, and to our guest, Arnold Roy. Please thank me and please join us in the back of the room.